Damas Unkungi, again, good afternoon. Um, at this stage in conferences, it is quite common for changes to be made. And I am going to propose some changes this afternoon for two reasons, if not three. One, to keep you interested and amused, because after such a delightful and wonderful lunch, sometimes it is difficult to pay 100% attention. It's for that reason that I never show slides after lunch, because I feel that I might be regarded as an agent provocateur otherwise. I, however, must tell you that we are changing the program slightly. I am saying something on injunctions as per script. Um, of course, um, Sir Richard and Thomas have both eloquently been talking to you about the, uh, some of the relief available uh, in a, a particularly specialized but increasingly important area of commercial activity which affects intellectual property. Indeed, since I retired, the move uh, forward has been utterly dramatic and has changed things very considerably. They've spoken about injunctions. They have spoken about the enforcement directive, which I was going to talk about. And therefore, what I have done is that I have rather focused what I'm going to tell you um, on some practical generalities and some, I hope, um, complementary uh, words uh, about relief, enforcement, and particularly injunctions. However, um, Sir Richard tells me that there have been some important developments on the question of injunctive relief in patent cases, and he, thank goodness, is going to follow me for 10 minutes and tell you a bit about those when I've finished on patents. But wait, it's not finished yet, because after that, I'm going to treat you to a story. Now, this is on the suggestion of Zane and with the approval of others. I was uh, subjected in 1997 to a most unfortunate incident, which uh, I think you should know about. Tom, one of Thomas's papers is called Aspects of IP Crime. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to have another aspect of IP crime to finish my talk. And it's not what you think it might be. But I'll let you keep guessing until the very last minute. But promise me, no crying in the back row when I tell you this story. Right, let's get on with it now. Um, as you know, an injunction is the normal outcome for a successful claimant, plaintiff, in a patent, or any other IP infringement action. Normal, I say. That is the position as I've always seen it. Um, of course, time and law move on, and there are developments which make it interesting. Um, but basically, um, a successful claimant can expect an injunction. We'll deal in a moment with the nature of the injunction and the sort of injunctions there are. I also want to say something about um, procedure a little bit and about also um, some of the remedies that we've not talked about yet. There are essentially three but often four stages of progress in IP cases. There is first of all, there may first of all be an initial ex parte stage. Now ex parte is Latin and it means one part, one party only, as opposed to inter parties, which means both parties are involved, or there may be more than two. So there can be, first of all, an ex parte stage. There is very often an inter parties or interlocutory stage. There is the full trial itself, very often, but not always. And when there is, there may, but not always be, 
a, a, a question of damages. Now, let me say at the outset that I don't intend to say really anything about damages. The question has been admirably covered by Sir Richard uh, uh, on two occasions this morning. So, one way or another, what he said in relation to the field in which he spoke is also true, by and large, of IP in general. Um, but there are things to say along the way. Um, I'm not concerned with procedure at this stage, or at least at any stage, because I don't know anything about Latvian procedure. But um, I think some of what we do in the United Kingdom and Ireland may be relevant. And, um, uh, and, and uh, uh, just so we can make it clear, in uh, Scotland they do other things as well. But I'm not going to speak about that. Specialist IP courts. As you may know, I can just say a word about this. In the United Kingdom, since 1949, we have had a specialist court, which although is, called, is a, basically a patent court, a court also dealing with registered designs, um, has in practice dealt with increasingly all IP cases. Um, it doesn't... It's never had to deal with trademarks. It doesn't have exclusive jurisdiction on copyright, but on patents and registers designs, it does. However, um, now that we have uh, the custom of having more than one IP specialist judge, it has come about that a lot, if not most of the general IP work go to the judge or judges that have been specially appointed. And I've noticed a trend, indeed I've been involved in one or two countries, with an increasing specialization among judges in some other countries which have a high level of IP work of uh, creating specialist courts. And uh, that has happened um, in some European countries. Um, it's happening now in India. Um, it's happened in various other places. And that has got advantages and disadvantages. The advantages are roughly these. Very often the judges, certainly in some jurisdictions, in the specialist courts, have got scientific qualifications. Um, for what it's worth, I was once a chemist. I did a chemistry degree at the university, and my tutor made it fairly clear that I wouldn't be any use as a scientist. So having got a degree, I took that to heart. And what can I do? Well, you can teach, or you can be a patent barrister, la a lawyer, or agent, or whatever. So I took the latter course. Um, you don't have to have a science degree, but it does help, particularly today, when the technological uh, complication of um, many of the cases that we get in a few of the developing fields, at least, uh, um, play their part. Our cases, on the whole, um, until about 20, 25 years ago, were fairly simple mechanical cases. And uh, I, I always believed that it was well within the competence of an intelligence um, common law judge to uh, deal with, with anything like that that came his way. But then came cases like uh, the color television cases and then the um, microbiological cases, etc., etc., and the degree of complexity was much greater. One little sideline on that is the question of court experts. I'm often asked about the position of court experts in the United Kingdom and Ireland. Now, we don't generally favor court experts. They have been appointed in certain cases, particularly at the court of appeal level, to assist the court. They don't function like in, I understand, in Italy, pretty well every IP patent case has got a court expert. And he may be, or she, of course, whenever I say he, I mean she too, um, uh, he or she 
will be there to give a, an open view in the form of uh, a written uh, brief of, uh, concerning the technical side of the case. Usually the parties disagree and then they are uh, rather like some biological process. Two more experts are then appointed to consider the report of the first expert and I have even come across a case in Milan in which a further biological um, mycosis took place and there were now four experts all criticizing each other and, um, in my view, wasting a good deal of time. So court experts are possible. In our jurisdiction, they do get appointed in medical cases. Not that I'm an expert in that area, but they do get appointed for that purpose. And um, in IP cases, very rarely. We have had some recombinant uh, technology cases. We've had the color television cases in which they have sat with the Court of Appeal and say nothing at all. They sit with the judges and, of course, the judges, as Sir Richard will tell you, between 4 and 4.30 retire for a British cup of tea and they are, in, when the expert is there, accompanied by the expert and, no doubt, um, important discussions ensue. But we know nothing about what they say, what part they play. They may play no part to, in decision making, but they do ensure that our judgments in highly technical cases are technically correct. Um, and that is what we do. I don't know what the position is in Latvia, but certainly, uh, my own experience in Italy leaves me in no doubt that um, the system of having a single expert is a waste of time. However, in patent cases and in other cases, and I touched upon this on the question of cost in my first talk, we do, of course, have experts frequently, very frequently in patent cases. The experts are there to give, obviously, in the traditional way, expert opinions about things. Um, their reputation very often depends upon it. It's a very important job. Let's just go look at the experts just for a moment. Experts are very often uh, difficult people, as you judges will discover when you have uh, to deal with experts. Um, very often they're professors, therefore, very often not readily available. They're always correcting doctorates, doing things at universities, and so on. However, um, and they are also expensive. However, they are absolutely vital in most patent cases, and, and they have, their evidence is of, great, of the greatest importance. Now let me proceed back to the, the mainstream. Um, Injunctive relief. Um, the availability of appropriate relief for infringement of IP uh, in, is in general, uh, particularly is injunctive relief, and is, is, is uh, basically, as Sir Richard said, um, IP stops people doing things. It, injunctions have two aspects. Some are negative in aspect, others are positive. Um, the... Uh, legislation, both European and uh, domestic, provide for an array of possible remedies that follow, and I should be looking briefly at other remedies to give a comprehensive picture uh, of uh, uh, what is available to a successful uh, claimant. Um, anyway, it is the fact that at the end of a case, an, uh, a successful claimant does expect to get his injunction. We also um, have relief available to a successful litigant in the form of mandatory injunctions, but um, the former, um, the prohibitory ones, are the ones that we're mostly concerned with. Um, they may be categorized as final or permanent injunctions, or interim or interlocutory. And, uh, uh, 
uh, it, the, we um, have already, I think, in connection with our discussion yesterday on trade secrets, um, had some uh, interest in the form of injunctions, uh, which I'm going to move on to in a moment. It's worth saying at the outset that the terms of an injunction, um, like any other court order, must be as clear as the subject matter admits of, particularly in relation to interim injunctions or interlocutory injunctions. A party injuncted must be in a position clearly to know what it can and cannot do. Why? because disobedience to a court order is a serious matter. I'm not aware of what, uh, uh, what we call contempt proceedings may lead to in Latvia, but certainly in the United Kingdom, disobedience to a court order can be a very serious matter. Just a word about this. Um, when it does happen, it's called contempt of court, by the way. When it does happen, um, the party affected will have to show that the injunction has been breached with great cl clarity. The, 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 the standard of proof is beyond, generally, is beyond reasonable doubt. It, it's been described as being a semi-criminal proceeding. Doesn't often happen, but when it does, the results can be very serious for the person affected. So, therefore, we want, I should say, it, it can involve a, a heavy fine or even imprisonment. So the um, terms of the injunction must obviously be very clear. Um, some judges are more meticulous than others about this, and you'll find that there is a, a, a range of practice in the courts. Um, for example, um, one can simply say at the end of a patent infringement case, an injunction to restrain infringement of patent number such and such. However, in interlocutory cases, more often it's limited by reference to, let us say, a specific exhibit or something like that, because in interlocutory cases, as, as you all know, um, a final determination has not yet been made. Uh, because that, 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 that is obviously, obviously to come. So the wording of the injunction will be carefully scrutinized to ensure that it is no wider than is justified in the circumstances. Now, I should say at this junction, uh, a juncture mentioned something that I touched on a moment ago, and that is that Sir Richard has got a few things to say after my spiel on injunctions, uh, because there have been some important developments in the patent field in the uh, jurisprudence of the, of the High Court in the United Kingdom. I've put between pages two and three some of the relevant sources that are uh, 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 in issue and in my talk, um, including the uh, bits from the enforcement directive, um, and you'll see them there. They have already been referred to by some of the speakers already, and I, I needn't, I needn't um, elaborate on, on that. Now, I want to take the situation a little further. Let's look at ex parte matters. Ex parte, as I say, means one side only. Pre-action and precautionary measures, seizure, Article 10, and mandatory injunctions. Now, it's often necessary to take um, ex parte uh, measures against potential infringers because of the way they conduct their business. Um, and since this practice started, I started about 20, 25 years ago, in a famous case in London called Anton Pillar. You'll hear that phrase used occasionally, now called um, search and seize, um, and various other names are given to it. It rapidly spread um, throughout the uh, um, common law um, territory. Uh, I don't know what they do in the United States, but certainly Commonwealth countries all have it, and they're referred to as Anton Pillars, or in Ireland as Anton Peelers. But anyway, um, uh, they have proved to be of immense use, hugely successful in my first one, um, 
the um, injunction was presented um, at a factory, and we could actually hear the noise of uh, astonishment in the factory as news spread that a posse of people had come to inspect and take things away, and we immediately heard the flushing of toilets and the noise of cars leaving the, pre the, the premises, uh, which showed that um, the order was effectively, was effectively made and uh, indeed um, um, well carried out in that particular case. The evidence has got to be presented to the court very well indeed, because mere suspicion is not enough. I need hardly say that, but um, the evidence has got to be as good as it can be, and if something goes wrong, woe betide you, because it is the, uh, the judge will make his order or her order on the basis of that evidence that is before the court. It's got to be accurate, and if it's not accurate, the order can be discharged, and there can be a serious costs issue to follow. If the infringer has notice of an impending action, uh, the, and he or she may conceal what is going on or make it difficult for the patentee to proceed. With advance warning, they can also, of course, take financial steps to make sure that any action may become futile. And there's another sort of order that is frequently made, uh, named after a case like Anton Piller, um, which is called a Mareva. That's the name of a ship, which was the uh, subject matter of that particular action, which can freeze bank accounts. Uh, these are now, of course, um, pretty common, uh, these orders. But when they were first made, not so long ago, they were regarded as being quite revolutionary. Um, one famous judge, a man called Lord Denning, referred to them as the nuclear arsenal of the IP, of the bar. And um, similar procedures have existed, of course, in the past, but not quite as effectively. And, of course, um, in Belgium and in France, you have the saisie contre façon which operates in a similar sort of way. The yield, as it's called, of an Anton Pillar order, a search and seizure order, is in the hands of the solicitor who is in charge of the operation. Now, the solicitor, the lawyer, who is in charge of getting the order and of carrying it out, has got a heavy duty upon him to carry it out exactly and correctly. He will make a list, a careful list, of everything that's found. Um, an, an order can be made uh, against a particular locus, a place, a factory, a car, a filing cabinet, anything you like. If it yields something, it will be recorded and uh, it will be taken away. And um, the recording procedure is such that the people affected, somebody, a representative of the person affected, will be required to sign a list at the end, and the whole thing has got to be done extremely carefully, because there could be retribution later if the person affected comes back to the court saying it wasn't done properly, I want the order discharged. Now, money is also involved in a different way when an interlocutory or an ex parte injunction is made, there is something called a cross undertaking as to damages, which means that the person who has got the order, of course it's, a, it's an order that we, 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 we can only um, um, base it on what we know at the time, or what the court knows at the time, what the plaintiff knows, it may be wrong, in which case the defendant may be wrongly affected and may be financially affected wrongly. Um, the effect may be commercial, uh, manufacturing, or it may even be um, what happened once in Singapore. The first time it happened in Singapore, the solicitor sent in for the police to uh, assist, and the police did assist. They brought out two helicopters. Um, it was said later when it turned out that the 
order was wrongly made, that the presence of two police helicopters hovering over the factory had an adverse effect on their sales. Well, you can imagine how that argument went. But anyway, um, uh, there is this question of a cross undertaking as to damages, as it's called. And sometimes that is invoked when things go wrong. So beware. Um, now, uh, in either of these cases, um, the uh, provisional, a provisional injunction may be granted over a short while. That's ex parte. It then becomes, it's served, and it becomes inter parties, and usually there's a return day within a week where you come back to the court when the, uh, um, th the thunderstorm has settled a bit, and you come back and the judge will then uh, get together with the parties and sort out what should be done next. Um, <clears throat> the procedures are, uh, I needn't go into them, but as I say, there has got a full, uh, a full and frank obligation <coughs> to produce evidence of high quality to sustain such an application. Um, I should say one other practical thing, and that is in common law jurisdictions where the defendant is a small company without apparent assets, it's very common practice in IP cases to sue the director as well. And there is a, a corpus of law on the liability of directors piercing the corporate veil, all that sort of thing, which I think it's beyond the scope of this talk to go into. Let's move on to interim or interlocutory injunctions. Article 9.1, I think it is, of the Enforcement Directive. Um, this is a very common way uh, in our jurisdictions of, of, of um, starting IP actions. Um, the defendant is served. There is a return day. <coughs> You talk to the judge about um, uh, when ev evidence in reply should be put in. It starts with a, um, what we used to call a writ or a claim form and appropriate evidence in the form of uh, what we used to call an affidavit uh, or statutory declaration now. Um, it, the defendant obviously has, uh, if he's going to resist it, is given time to file evidence in reply, and um, the various stages of the interlocutory exercise are gone into with the judge, timings are provided, and so on. And um, there is then a hearing. And the first thing to remember is this is, in our jurisdictions, not a mini-trial. It is not a mini-trial. It is a procedure uh, that will, the object of which is to maintain the status quo while the full action is yet to be tried, and also to prevent irreparable damage being done to the claimant in the interim, if in the interim, in the, if should he prove to be successful. Um, in other words, damage if damage in the appropriate measure, and that's often difficult, of course, as you know from Sir Richard to determine, but it, on an approximate basis, if it looks as though damage on the appropriate level is going to be um, difficult to determine or impossible, for example, goodwill in a passing off or uh, in trademark cases is, is pretty difficult to, to assess, um, uh, you, uh, the court is inclined to grant an injunction because it says uh, there may be irreparable harm. In other words, harm that can't be adequately um, assessed. Irreparable harm being done to the claimant in the interim period. In other words, damages in the appropriate measure would be inadequate or difficult to assess. Uh, in, uh, again, the claimant must put forward evidence that it can meet a cross undertaking into damages, as I've explained, and that leads also to some uh, elaborate argument from time to time. And um, uh, it is rarely, as I say, the jobs, the court of the, uh, will not go into the merits of the case, 
Matters like invalidity, particularly in patent cases, will um, never, I, I suppose in theory it's possible, but in the clearest case, but they'll never go into the question, questions of validity of a design patent or trademark at the interlocutory stage. It is not a mini trial. It is done on the balance of convenience, or as I often called it as a judge, the balance of inconvenience. It's an assessment that's made afresh each time, and with that brief guidance, the judge has to do his best to work out where the balance of justice lies. Another factor that I've not yet mentioned, but which is relevant, will be delay. No good coming to the judge saying, judge, help, help, help. This defendant is doing something terrible. He's infringing my trademark. And when did you get to know about that? Oh, about a year ago. Well, why are you coming asking for an interlocutory injunction? Too late. So delay also is a factor to be borne in mind. In fact, a lot of factors must be borne in mind. Now, it's also right to say that in some jurisdictions in the common law system, it is the fact that cases never get beyond the interlocutory stage. I have been reliably told that the last time there was a full patent infringement action in India was in 1956. Everything is decided on the interlocutory. Now, of course, in the United Kingdom as well, you find, I don't know what percentage, but a good percentage of the cases settle one way or the other after the interlocutory, which, of course, can be appealed, but it, it's you don't find many interlocutories being appealed. And um, it is uh, the case that uh, um, interlocutory injunctions are very, very common in, with, uh, in, 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 in IP cases. Um, there is a lot more to be said about interlocutory or interim injunctions and the approach of the court, but basically it is the status quo, the balance of convenience, delay, and the general justice of the situation. Now, the injunction, if successful, the claimant will get an injunction, and if he does, that is also the subject of careful scrutiny by the court, because very often it is issued in only limited form to hold the status quo. Now, let's look at permanent injunctions. Uh, permanent injunctions um, are granted, of course, at the end of a case where the claimant is successful. Uh, in common law jurisdictions, the grant of, interlocutory re of injunctive relief permanent form is nevertheless discretionary, but is normally given. Uh, that said, there are occasions when a court will not order an injunction, for example, to protect certain rights of prior user. One or two cases have come up in the um, in pharmaceutical field where the infringement is apparently um, of critical importance to some patients. Um, and, but, and, and I don't want to open discussions on uh, FRAND and compulsory license type re responses at this stage. Um, but there are one or two situations which uh, in which the uh, permanent injunction is not given. And I think uh, Sir Richard will, may, may have something to say about that uh, in due course, so I'll say no more. Could I just mention strikeout? We have a procedure in the common law jurisdictions for striking out hopeless claims and hopeless defenses. Um, I won't go into it in great detail, but sometimes, not often, it is worth having a go to save costs, to save trouble, having a go at striking out a case. Um, the defendant saying that this is simply a try on by typically, it used to happen in the, uh, what used to be the Patents County Court, um, um, a large company uh, suing a tiny little minnow, a small company um, with the might of many uh, great legal minds and um, uh, the uh, claim being uh, on its face 
very thin indeed. The defendant can quite often have a go to try and strike the claim out. It doesn't always happen, and there are certain rules, only clear cases, and so on. Um, damages uh, has already been done in admirable clarity by Sir Richard and by uh, Thomas Dillon. Um, corrective measures, ancillary relief, and right of information. Um, the successful claimant will also be entitled, in addition to injunction, then damages and um, interest on damages, of course, uh, to delivery up or destruction on oath, sometimes, of infringing goods as the, at the infringer's expense. Um, this has got to be done with some caution, and I'll tell you a story uh, of an infringement case in which um, the subject matter was an infringement of the perfume Chanel Number no. 5. And it was a, an infringer from, um, who bought this stuff, the infringing uh, bottles with the trademark on from Pakistan, and I found uh, that uh, I found against him. And on ordering um, a, uh, uh, a destruction of the infringing goods, both parties agreed to that, the light of my judgment, I discovered some time later that the solicitors had decided to burn, the, to break the bottles and burn the contents. Unfortunately, an explosion ensued in which both solicitors received burns. So you better be careful in ordering destruction of goods. It doesn't always work for the best. Um, uh, other ancillary relief is available, such as recall, from um, channels of commerce, often very difficult to be discussed with the parties when you've reached a conclusion, um, and also uh, um, orders to reveal, uh, particularly in the cases of importation, um, where the source of the imports were in sufficient detail. Um, <clears throat> and also in the quantities, um, and details about the importation, because following what was said this morning um, in the question of an election between uh, an inquiry as to damages and account of profits, it is often important at that stage to find out what, uh, or to some extent, what the commercial picture is regarding the infringement, so that the um, successful claimant can make um, an informed election. And then, of course, the um, uh, question of costs is involved. Now, I don't think at this stage I need say any more um, because I'm looking at my watch. And um, maybe this is the time, Richard, where you would like to say something about the latest developments in the world of patents and injunctions. Thank you very much. So, the question of injunctions in patent cases has become intensely debated over the past few years. Uh, I am often asked to speak at conferences and seminars like this one all around the world. And in the past, the subject on which I was most often asked to speak was the one I was talking about this morning, website blocking. But in the t last two years, the subject I've been asked to speak most often about is injunctions in patent cases. There are at least two multi-author academic treatises in the course of preparation, one of which I am a contributor to, and a lot of PhD theses are being written on this subject, and uh, it seems to be attracting a great deal of interest worldwide, but specifically um, in the EU. Now, why is this so? If we go back in time, it was the practice of courts pretty well worldwide in patent cases, if they found a patent valid and infringed, to grant an injunction to stop further infringements. In some countries, this was effectively a rule of law. An injunction was an automatic remedy. In other countries, that was not a rule of law, but it was a rule of practice. In practice, it was always done. Now, 
The picture started to change as a result of a decision of the Supreme Court of the United States of America in 2006 in a case called eBay and Merck. And they said in that case that it was wrong automatically to grant an injunction in a patent case and that rather the court needed to exercise its discretion and decide whether an injunction was an appropriate remedy in the circumstances of the case, and they laid down four factors to be taken into account in making that decision. That decision has had quite a, an impact in the practice of the US courts, whereas beforehand um, injunctions were granted in roughly 100% of cases. Nowadays, the percentage of cases in which in grant, injunctions is granted is much smaller. It depends on the field. Um, but in some areas of technology, it's as low as 50 or 60%. I mean, the statistics go up and down all the time. So it's difficult to give you a, an entirely accurate and up-to-date picture. But certainly, injunctions have ceased to be an automatic remedy in the US courts for patent infringement. Now, if we turn to the position in the EU, we now have, of course, the Enforcement Directive of 2004. And as I pointed out to you earlier, Article 3 of the Enforcement Directive lays down certain general criteria for the grant of all remedies in intellectual property cases. And one of those, which is specified in Article 3, Paragraph 2, is that the measures specified in the directive must be proportionate. Not only that, the recitals to the enforcement directive state explicitly that in deciding whether to grant remedies for intellectual property right infringement, a case-by-case -case assessment must be carried out and that it must depend upon the individual circumstances of the case. Furthermore, since the uh, Enforcement Directive came into force, there have been a series of decisions of the Court of Justice of the European Union in cases involving copyrights and trademarks in which the Courts of Justice of the EU has stated time and time again that it is a requirement for courts granting injunctions to consider the proportionality of the injunction um, and whether it's justified on the facts of the case. Now, as the courts have also pointed out in a series of cases, um, the provisions of the enforcement directive are horizontal and they apply to all intellectual property cases. And therefore, the upshot, it seems to me, is extremely clear. Namely, that as a matter of EU law, courts in all member states cannot apply any automatic rule when granting an injunction in a patent case. To the contrary, they are obliged as a matter of EU law to consider on a case-by-case -case basis whether an injunction is appropriate and only to grant an injunction where it would be proportionate to do so. Now, it has to be said that although I think this is crystal clear as a matter of EU law and admits of no argument, give us because of all the cases, nevertheless, there are certain member states where this has met with a lot of resistance. There are certain member states where they cling to the rule that an injunction is an automatic remedy for patent infringement. Um, and the reason they give for this is that firstly, a patent is a property right, and secondly, a patent is a monopoly. And they say, well, if your monopoly has been invaded by an infringer, you must be entitled automatically to an injunction to put an end to that invasion of your monopoly. Now, as I say, it seems to me to be perfectly clear that as a matter of EU law, that is wrong. But nevertheless, that is the, the debate that is currently going on. Um, and just to illustrate where matters have got to, um, in Germany, where there is still a considerable body of opinion, 
that clings to the old view that an, an injunction is an automatic remedy in patent cases, there has been considerable agita agitation over the last two years for an amendment to the Patents Act to specifically write into the German Patents Act the requirement of proportionality. Presently, that's still under de debate in, in Germany, and we obviously will have to wait and see what the outcome is. But I would say, well, EU law is supreme. They're obliged to do it anyway, regardless of what the German Patents Act says. Um, but let me just finish by explaining to you how this works in practice, because I'm pleased to tell you that in the United Kingdom, we comply with EU law, all right? At least until Brexit. So we apply the requirement of proportionality when deciding to grant an injunction in a patent case. Now, contrary to what has been going on in the USA, since eBay and Merck, we don't think that that means that you refuse an injunction in many cat patent cases. On the contrary, we think that in most patent cases, it will generally be proportionate to grant an injunction. But you can't apply a blanket rule. You have to stop and think about it and look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. So I've given two leading judgments on this subject. One is a case called HTC and Nokia back in 2013. Now, this was a case about mobile phones, but it was not a case about standard essential patents or SEPs, which give rise to rather specific considerations. And Nokia um, were the patentees in that case. HTC were found to have infringed Nokia's patent. And HTC tried to resist the grant of an injunction, saying it would be disproportionate. And having considered all the arguments, I held that the injunction, on the contrary, would be proportionate and should be granted. And if you look at the reasoning, the essence of the reasoning was that um, uh, the injunction would not be disproportionate because it wouldn't cause um, uh, disproportionate damage to HTC, the infringers. They already had some non-infringing alternatives available to them. If they'd reacted more quickly when sued by Nokia, they could have had more, more infringing non-infringing non alternatives available to them. And in the period left before expiry of the patent, they had plenty of time to produce yet further non-infringing alternatives. By contrast, I would give you a decision I made last year, 2018, in a case called Boston Scientific and Edwards. Now, this was uh, a case involving uh, transcatheter heart valves. So these are devices which are implanted into the hearts of patients who have faulty heart valves. And they are life-saving devices because if you don't, if you have heart disease uh, and you have problems with your heart valves and you don't have one of these devices, medication can help you to a certain extent, but eventually it will kill you. And so the effect of having one of these transcatheter heart valves implanted um, is to extend patients' lives by several years. So that's, this is wonderfully beneficial technology. So the patent was held to be valid and infringed, uh, and the uh, infringer uh, in this case was Edwards. Um, but there was then a big argument about the injunction, and the question at issue was this. It was accepted by Edwards that there should be an injunction to stop infringement, but what they said was there should be two modifications to the injunction. Firstly, there should be a delay in the injunction coming into effect for a period of time. Secondly, they said that there should be an exception to the scope of the injunction so that it shouldn't apply in certain circumstances. And having considered all of the arguments, I agreed with Edwards, and I delayed the injunction coming into effect for a period of a year, and I made an exception to the scope of the injunction. And the reasons for that, um, in summary, were as follows. First of all, in terms of the delay, the problem was that 
doctors throughout the United Kingdom had been trained to use the infringing valve. That was the one they knew how to use. And as you can imagine, if you're putting a, a new valve into a patient's heart, it's a very delicate and sensitive operation. Um, and the doctors require a lot of training if they're being going to be able to do it without killing the patient in the process on the operating table. So the doctors have been trained to use the infringing device. So you needed a period of time for the doctors to be retrained to use the new device. And, of course, they were busy people, um, and, you know, they needed a lot of practice and time to do this. So my judgment was that on the evidence, it was going to take a minimum of a year to get all the doctors retrained, and so I delayed the injunction for a year. Moreover, I said that if it turned out that not enough doctors could be retrained within one year, they could come back to ask for a further extension. So that was the first point. The second point was to make an exception to the scope of the injunction, because what the evidence showed was that there was a certain group of patients for whom there was no suitable non-infringing alternative. That is to say, for those patients, the only device that worked was the infringing device. And so I said, for that group of patients, the injunction does not apply, and Edwards could con continue to supply the infringing device to those patients. Um, but what I also said was that if it turned out that at a future point in time, a non-infringing device became available that would suit those patients, then Boston, who were the patentee, could come back to court to have that exception terminated. Now, I took the view that so far as that second decision was concerned, the decision was a no-brainer, to use the American parlance. And the reason was why I thought it was a no-brainer was because if I granted the injunction without that qualification, patients were going to die. And I didn't see why patients should die as a result of me granting an injunction to stop the availability of an infringing device to those patients. Let me contrast to you what happened in Switzerland, which although it's not an EU member state, they apply the EU acquis in this area, including the Enforcement Directive. So what happened in Switzerland, in a parallel case, was that the court said, well, the infringer has not applied for a compulsory license, and therefore we grant an injunction. If patients die, so what? Well, I'm sorry, but I just do not think that that's acceptable. I think it is the job of courts to do justice, and the fact that an infringer may not have applied for a compulsory license when they should have done does not absolve the court from its responsibility to decide what is the correct decision. And it seems to me that an injunction which results in patients being killed is quite obviously disproportionate. Thank you. Get your handkerchiefs ready. This is a case of criminality at IP of a different kind. I'm a member of the Irish Bar, and I received a telephone call one afternoon from Dublin asking me to act in a patent infringement case involving an Irish offshore company because such things exist in the Republic of Ireland for tax reasons. Two well-known European pharmaceutical firms were involved, and I was told that infringement on a massive degree was taking place in South America and in the Caribbean and Central America. Indeed, their sales had dropped to virtually nothing in these territories, yet they had 
patents there in respect of these two very important drugs which I shall not identify. What to do? So first of all, invoking some of the procedures that I've already told you about, I went to the court in Dublin and I got a search and seize order against a firm of accountants and found a huge number of invoices that were relating to the drugs going en route to South America via various airports in Europe. So we then got further injunctions in Italy, Hungary, and Germany to seize material in, at various airports that we had discovered through the process in Dublin. And we also discovered in Dublin, looking at the, at the documents, that there was also a very vigorous trade in these drugs through the tax-free island of Guernsey in the Channel. It's a little group of islands. You may or may not know of them. They are tax havens. They are ancient possessions of Britain. They're not colonies. They're not part of Britain. They're weird, frankly. And so we went to Guernsey. I couldn't appear in court there. It's all done in medieval French. You wouldn't believe it. But we got another order there. And there was so much infringing material going through various places and being invoiced through Jersey and Dublin that my French client nearly fainted. He said, but this is more than our entire production in France. Yes, it was. It all came from India. Now, in India at that time, there were no pharmaceutical drugs. I mean, no, sorry, no pharmaceutical patents relating uh, to, uh, to drugs. Um, and uh, that's different, of course, now it's been, uh, India has joined the, uh, the, uh, the, the rest of uh, other countries and has proper pharmaceutical protection. But at that time, the um, raw substance was su substances, there were two of them, were made legitimately in India and then imported. Um, so I said to the clients, I said, well, we've got these ex parte orders, we've got to prove all this. So we then did what is called, I haven't told you about this yet, a trap order based on an imaginary on a company in Cyprus that I invented the name the Al Diarrhea Pharmaceutical Supply Company, which I thought was a suitable name for a, um, a, a false company in Cyprus. We obtained the drug from the Indian source, and sure enough, it analyzed perfectly onto claim one of both of the patents in issue. So the next thing was, uh, of course, the other side got to know and the battle began. And the battle, I'll tell you, was very fierce. And in, in due course, it led to a large bank account in the British Virgin Islands, another tax haven. By the way, we're talking of millions of dollars none of which had attracted tax anywhere because it was all done through tax havens. However, the British Virgin Islands are still a British colony. I think they're called British Overseas Territories or something. Now we have a nicer word, we don't use colonies. And I, as a British QC, Queen's Council, was entitled to appear in court. So I was duly instructed to go down to this tropical paradise and get an order to open up a bank account, um, which they didn't know that we knew about, but it was work we worked backwards from one of the seizures on a previous occasion. So I got there and uh, arrangements were made for me to appear in court. And this is where the trouble started. As a friend of mine, a barrister, a solicitor, also said, did you use encrypted fax? I said, no. He said, you watch it, they'll get you. 
So I went down to the British Virgin Islands. We had a very nice conference with the French and German clients on a French island called St. Bart's. And we flew over the next day via an island called St. Martin to appear in court the following day in uh, the island of Tortola, which is the capital of the British Virgin Islands. So far, so good. A little gang of us. We had four hours to spare on the island of St. Martin. St. Martin is half French and half Dutch. It's another colony. What to do there? I had been there once before, and I said, we'll get into a taxi and just have a quick look round and then come back again. So we did that. What to see? Well, there is incredibly a boundary between the French and the Dutch parts of this island with a monument, and I thought it would be rather fun to have some photographs taken at this monument. Willkommen in der Niederland, and on the other side, vous êtes bienvenue en France. Very funny. So with my French and German uh, lawyers, I went over and we had photographs taken. We then crossed the road. And to go back to our taxi, for some reason, and I did think it odd at the time, the taxi was parked on the wrong side of the road. So we had to cross the road. And as we did so, one of the assistants of the German client began screaming. And she said, look out, watch, look, look, look. And I saw a small white sports car coming along this road at fantastic speed. And we just got out of the way. It plowed into the grass on the side of the road, nearly hit the parked taxi. We were knocked over, and the car went into the air, turned over five or six times, and we were severely injured, very severely injured. And uh, I was out of action for, what, six months, I think. And uh, fortunately, only my legs were broken and a few other things, and my German and French solicitors, um, lawyers, had a concussion and um, the car had gone over the foot of one of them who, can't work, who hardly can walk anymore, incidentally. And we were severely injured. It was a beautiful day, like this, about four in the afternoon, and the car was the only car on the road. It deliberately drove at us. So I inquired um, what had happened to the driver, and they said, Oh, you'd be surprised, he seems fine. The car is written off, but the driver seems all right. I said, well, what was he doing? He said, well, he was, he was going to the airport, on the, which is on the Dutch side, to try and get onto a plane to stop his wife going back to Paris with their baby or some explanation like this. Anyway, <clears throat> I was put in hospital in a Dutch colonial hospital for two or three days in a cancer ward. And several people died while I was there. And uh, it was a very grim experience. And then finally, an aeroplane came to collect me and my French and German patent attorneys. We were taken by ambulance to the um, uh, air ambulance, which was waiting for us at the airport with its engines running. It was a Comanche 250 or something like that, and it could take stretcher cases. So we all got into it. We were put on the floor because we were badly injured from the hospital. We, I was very badly treated in hospital. Nobody wanted to do anything. And everybody suddenly couldn't speak English. They could only speak a language called Papiamento, which is a cross between it's the language of the Dutch Antilles. And, um, of course, everybody was deeply suspicious. So we got onto the aeroplane, and suddenly a French police car came up with flashing lights. 
And the policeman got out and said, vos papiers, your papers. The pilot, who was an American, because I was being flown to, we were being flown to Puerto Rico, said, we've shown our papers, we're all clear. We're a professional ambulance company. The French said, no, you're not, get out and take your patients out. And the, they began shouting at each other. And one of the police officers pulled out his pistol and said, get out. And the American, who looked like John Wayne and behaved like John Wayne, put, said to me on the floor, hold tight, we're off. And I saw his hand go down and the co-pilot's hand on the red throttles and they banged them forward. The plane rose in the air because the engine suddenly roared into action. And he took the wing of the airplane over the top of the French police car, over the grass, onto the tarmac, over some more grass, and took off. And he said, I'll never forget, he said, don't worry, he said, there are no anti-aircraft guns on St. Martin. <laughs> and so we got to Puerto Rico, where I spent a few days in the general hospital, but having been x-rayed by a, a fantastic machine provided by the American government. And uh, I couldn't stand it there because everybody had gunshot wounds and they were all manacled to their beds. So I asked for uh, another hospital. They found me another hospital. There I spent a few weeks and I was then airlifted back to England. And in due course, after some operations, I got better. And the French chap, same thing, and the German, the same. And that was that, except a year later, my wife got a letter from Italy. Oh, I should say that the main culprits behind all this was an Italian group led by a lady from Palermo. And the letter was written in old-fashioned, very old-fashioned writing, like 19th century writing, you know? To my wife, perfect address, perfect postcode. It began, Senora, and a friend of, uh, it was, I could understand what was said, but it was translated. It said this, it is with the greatest sadness that we have heard of the tragic death of your husband. What is particularly tragic is the manner in which he died. This must cause you immense distress with our best wishes. And there was a name and an address. So this put a little slightly different complexion on the morning's proceedings. And I phoned up my uh, clients and I said, get going, find out what's going on. It, there's, it's a town on Lake Como. So they sent cars up that day to Lake Como. It turned out to be a hairdressing saloon with an elderly lady doing old lady's hair. And they showed the, the thing that we faxed it over. No idea where it came from. And there have been one or two other things, time's getting on, I won't tell you, which makes me sure that I'm being watched. That's why I'm not telling you very much. But I tell you this story, and every year I'm asked by Alicante to tell this story, because as judges you should be aware that in many IP cases there is so much money involved that organized crime may follow you. So the moral of the story is go ahead, but keep a good lookout. You never know what may happen. There you are. <laughs>